Over the next hour, we'll be going in depth on the key issues facing residents of the first congressional district and the country. Each candidate will have an opportunity to give a 45 second closing statement at the end of this debate. And the candidates are, from left to right on your screen, Pawtucket State Senator Sandra Cano, Rhode Island Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, Providence City Councilman John Gonsalves, Winsocket State Representative Stephen Casey, former White House staffer Gabe Amo, Providence State Senator Ana Cazada, former U.S. Navy officer Walter Burbrick, and former Providence State Representative Aaron Regenberg. Candidates, this is the largest number of people we have had on stage in my 13 years moderating debates for Channel 12. And we have a lot to discuss. So Ted and I are going to approach this debate a little bit differently than we have in the past. And we encourage you to engage with the, each other. But if you're taking too long or not answering the questions, we will jump in. Let's begin. To start, all of you are Democrats. And we know that you agree on many of the big issues. But to make some of that clear to the people watching at home, I want to get through some topics quickly. We're going to start with a rapid fire section. I'm looking for a show of hands here. If your answer is yes, please raise your hand nice and high so the viewers at home know exactly where you stand. And we'll hear from some of you at the end of this section. Last year, House Democrats overwhelmingly voted in favor of the Women's Health Protection Act, a bill that would codify abortion rights into federal law. Raise your hand if you would have voted yes on the Women's Health Protection Act. All of you are a yes. Congress has considered legislation that would close the so-called gun show loophole. The law would require all buyers at gun shows, including from unlicensed private sellers, at, um, uh, unlicensed private sellers to undergo a federal background check. Raise your hand if you support legislation that would close the so-called gun show loophole. Again, all of you are a yes. Polls show a significant number of Democrats would prefer the party to have someone other than the incumbent as the nominee for president next year. Raise your hand if you support Joe Biden to be the Democratic nominee for president in 2024. Everyone but Mr. Casey supports Mr. Biden as a Democratic nominee. Final question in this section, and I believe I, I know where everyone stands on this, but for the, again, for the viewers at home. Raise your hand if you would have voted for the debt ceiling deal last spring that prevented the country from going into default. Everyone but Mr. Regenberg is a yes on that one. And, and Mr. Regenberg, why don't we talk about this for a second? You, you've been a standout on, on this issue. And I'm curious, would you still have voted no if you were the deciding vote? In other words, if it would have killed the bill? Uh, absolutely. If, if the, if the question we received was not how would you vote uh, if you were this, the deciding factor. In that case, obviously, you have to vote yes. That wasn't the situation. The situation was that Kevin McCarthy took our economy hostage in order to push through dangerous Republican cuts to critical programs. Hang on. It was an up or down vote, Mr. Regenberg. Yes or no? Would you have voted for the debt ceiling bill? Yes, absolutely. If, it, if you're the deciding factor, absolutely. My position is the same position. Hang on one second. My please. position is the same position as that of Senator Elizabeth Warren, Ed Markey, John Fetterman, reps like Katie Porter and Barbara Lee, folks in leadership like Rosa DeLauro, and uh, even more moderate reps like Dan Goldman and Adriano Espiat. Mr. Amo, you want to weigh in? So Aaron has said that he would vote to take this country into catastrophic default. That is saying that he knows better than Jack Reed, Sheldon Whitehouse, David Cicilline, and Seth Magaziner. I would have voted to stand with Rhode Islanders, not vote against Rhode Islanders. This is not a time to play politics with people's economic outcomes. Well, we'll go to Mr. Regenberg briefly, and I'll come over to the left-hand side. Again, Kevin McCarthy said that he had the Republican votes to deliver on this deal. Given that, a number of leading Democrats said, we didn't need to cheerlead for a Republican deal. I'm really glad that President Biden negotiated, I think, the best deal he possibly could have. It was still a hostage situation. And a lot of leading Democrats said we need to send a message about the precedent of Republicans every time the debt ceiling comes up, being able to hold the economy hostage. Again, this is a deal that had cuts to, to um, food okay, stamps we, we for seniors. Okay, we've heard that. Ms. Cano? Uh, hang on, please. Hang on, please, Ms. Cazada. implications would happen to working families in Rhode Island. And for us, we need to think about the people that we represent. And let's think about a SNAP program, social security benefits for seniors. That is what it was in the line. So if we are going to send someone to Congress, it needs to be someone that is going to protect all Rhode Islanders instead of playing the same. Ms. Matos, I'll give you a quick word here. Uh, Mr. Robert, 
just said um, the opposite of what he has said publicly before. He tweeted that we would have got a no on the debt ceiling. That's risky. And we have to think about the consequences that we're having as a country for having this fight over the debt ceiling over and over. Fish just lowered the credit rating for the United States from AAA to uh, AA plus. Those are the things that happens when we have that type of fight. And we're playing with people's life and wealth and incomes and people that are depending on Social Security and Medicare when we take those fights just because we want to show our political so, allies. I'll get back to you in a minute, Mr. Regenberg. Mr. Yeah. Gonzalez. I'm the other progressive on this stage, but I would be very pragmatic on this issue. This is about putting people first. So ultimately, what was on the line was Social Security, Medicare, and that is just a very irresponsible position for Mr. Regenberg to take. Our economy was certainly held hostage. We need to hold Republicans accountable for that. But to not vote in favor of this is largely irresponsible. Ms. Yes. Can we please have quiet in the auditorium? It's the same thing. We, we were playing with people, health insurance, uh, with Medicaid, with Social Security, and so many other people who depend on the check. We have people who are one check behind to become uh, lost their home. Then I think that it was very irresponsible for Mr. Aaron to say that he would vote no on we're, that decision. Uh, I'll get to you, Mr. Regenberg. We're going to wrap this up briefly for Mr. Casey and then Mr. Burbrick. Go. I think everybody's beat up Mr. Regenberg pretty well on this, but the issue, the issue is that it's completely irresponsible. It's like defaulting on your mortgage, just letting everything go. We, we wouldn't be able to to do anything here. I, th I think it's completely irresponsible, and it seemed like more of a game. All right, Mr. Burbrick. Yeah, look, I, I mean, it's dangerous, it's irresponsible, but it speaks to Aaron's uh, dishonesty and lack of integrity, because he, he said uh, four, four months ago, early on in this, that he would vote against it. Uh, Again, the question that we received from reporters was not how would you vote, as Tim just asked, if you were the deciding vote. In that case, obviously you have to vote yes. The question we received was how would you vote given the situation, which was that Kevin McCarthy said he could deliver Republican votes for a Republican deal. Many leading Democrats said given that, we don't need to cheerlead this Republican deal. Senator Elizabeth Warren, people like Jerry Nadler in leadership, um, I, feel very com I feel very comfortable with the company I keep on this analysis. To be clear, I don't, hold, I don't hold it against we're members of Congress who have a different analysis on this. It's a complicated situation. I've been in the legislature. I understand that some of these... I think, I think there, everyone's position on this is clear. So let's move to health care candidates. Uh, Democrats in Congress of all stripes say they want Americans to have affordable health care. But there are real disagreements in the House Democratic Caucus over how to reach that goal. Some want a so-called Medicare for all, single-payer system with no private insurers. Others suggest creating a public insurer option which would compete with but not replace existing insurers. So I want to hear where all of you stand on that. Ms. Connell, I'll start with you. Do you support or oppose abolishing private health insurance and replacing it with a government-run health plan for everybody? I do think that we need to move into Medicare for all. Right now, health care is very expensive for Americans, especially for Rhode Islanders. I would say that my parents depend in health insurance every time. And the pharmaceuticals are really profiting on uh, people instead of saving lives. My dad takes a medicine that is called Revlimid, and I thought that it was uh, $10,000 a month. And now, I checked today, it was $25,000 a month. That's not about uh, saving lives. This is about making profit for corporations, and I am for a medical for all. I'm going to go to Mr. Regenberg. Do you support, I think I know the answer, but do you support abolishing private health insurance, moving to a government-run plan for insurance? Health care should be a fundamental human right for everyone. That's not how it currently works in this country. Right now, health care is an opportunity for corporations to profit off our injuries and illnesses. I'm proud to be the only candidate in this race who has an actual record of taking on big pharma and health insurance executives to push for Medicare for all. I fought for that every year I was in the General Assembly. I'm proud to be supported by folks like Senator Bernie Sanders, who was here uh, on Sunday to rally for our campaign, who's been leading this fight. There are so many people struggling right now, struggling, as Senator Cano said, to fill their prescription drugs because of big pharma price gouging, struggling with the cost of, of health insurance continuing to go up and up. And meanwhile, big pharma CEOs, health insurance executives are making higher profits than they ever have. That is barbaric. And I think we have a responsibility to, to fight for Medicare for all. I think pragmatically, 
we're not going to pass Medicare for all in one fell swoop. I think the way to do it is by lowering the Medicare eligibility age as, as far as we ha can when we have the political capital, maybe down to 55, then down to 50, down to 45. We're building the constituency of folks who are invested in this, who understand that this is this, this system helps them, and we'll be able to actually, I think it's, people I don't call this a pipe dream. I'm all, I don't think let everybody it's a pipe in on this, but I want to keep bringing people in. Ms. Matos, your position on this. So my position is that we should have Medicare for all who wants it. If there is anyone that would like to have a different option, they can have the money to pay for a, a expense insurance, they can go for that. But we should have Medicare available for everyone. Everyone should have access to medical um, care. When you are trying to figure out how to pay your bills, and I can tell you, as someone that has a pre-existing condition, I'm so glad that we have the Obamacare in place. We have to strengthen the, Ob the Obamacare, making sure that it's expanded to cover more people until we're able to have Medicare for all. Uh, we're going to go back and forth. Mr. Berberk. Yeah, look, you, human, can you hear me? Yep. You're good. We yep. can hear you. You're good. The, the, healthcare is a human right. And look, my folks were, were paying almost $3,000 a month in between premiums and, and prescription drug costs before they jumped on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but we also are a nation of, of, of freedoms and choices. Uh, and I believe people should have the choice of whether or not to, to uh, go on a, the public option or, uh, or pursue their own private uh, option. Uh, but we need to strengthen Affordable Care Act to, to make sure that it works for, for Americans who need it uh, in times of need. And just so viewers at home, I believe we're using our backup microphone for Mr. Burbeck just so they understand. Thank you. Mr. Gonsalves. So we're paying exorbitant amounts of money for health care in this country to the likes that no other country in the modern day uh, world is, is experiencing. And this is coming down to putting people first. The price gouging that we're seeing with the pharmaceutical industry is something that we need to address head on. Look, I was just in East Providence recently, and I spoke to a woman Just, who, but just to get the clear answer so, off the top, do you, su you support Absolutely, or Medicare okay. for all. But this okay. is an important story because this is about people. This, Briefly, because we have a lot this, of candidates this, on the This seat. woman went to an emergency room, and she was there for six hours, and she walked out with a $17,000 bill. Our health care system isn't working. We need to fix that. And it's not just Medicare for all. We need Social Security expansion. So the Social Security Expansion Act is something that I would also support at the federal level. Thank you. Ms. Casada. Oh, definitely. I, I, we're talking about the richest country in the world, and it's unbelievable that people have to... I had a young man who had a car accident. And he refused to go to the doctor because he was afraid of the bill that his parents was going to get. And he died the next day. We're talking about the United States of America. We should have Medicaid for all. And, and we have the way to pay for this. Then I definitely agree we should go for Medicaid for all. For Mr. Everybody. Casey. Thank you. Mr. Casey. Medicare for all is a failed system. Okay. It was tried in Bernie Sanders' home state in Vermont. The state of Vermont had the highest number of people that were insured. Excuse me. Had the highest number of people that were insured. They also had per capita one of the healthiest populations, and that system failed dismally. I think what we need to do, and we can't. It hasn't worked anywhere. We're going to bring that system for the United States. That this is. We want to try something that hasn't worked. Okay. I think what we need to do is going to have a public option, so that we have insurance companies that are going to compete for business. They're going to drive down costs, and we're going to have better patient outcomes. Mr. Amo, I am in support of investing and doubling down on the progress of the Affordable Care Act. One of the most proud moments I've had in my political career was helping on the implementation of the uh, ACA when I worked for President Obama, enrolling people in health insurance for the first time. But what I would say is we do need to be practical about the reforms that we might be able to achieve. I do think lowering the Medicare eligibility But the question age, is, do you support, not, or, do you support oh, yeah. or oppose abolishing private health insurance and moving yeah. to one government managed plan? For I, I would not abolish uh, private health insurance. I would have a robust public option and look at the political realities that we face and try to get as much as we can to make sure that everybody has access to health care. Tim? All right, I want to address some criticisms some of you have faced while on the campaign trail. One issue came up just yesterday, Mr. Amo, the Working Families Party, a progressive group that backs Mr. Regenberg, blasted you in a memo to their supporters, pointing out that you took donations from lobbyists that, in their words, represent big pharma, big tobacco, big oil, and they warned voters to be wary of where your allegiances lie. Is the acceptance of these contributions a red flag to voters? It is, is not. I am the epitome of someone with a working family background. 
My dad owns a liquor store. He's probably watching this right now from that liquor store working the register. My mom is a nurse who's worked in nursing homes, a member of SEIU. So I'm not gonna take the, the lecturing from folks who are supporting a candidate who has a $125,000 contribution from his father-in-law to a super PAC. That is a red flag. That is a clear red flag, especially because of the dishonesty that underlines it. And so what I would say is, I am proud of the support that I've received uh, from a range of folks, and I will continue to make my case about why my background and why someone like me going to Congress would be so meaningful for people here in the first district. Well, Mr. Regenberg, he didn't invoke your name, but he was talking about you, uh, your father-in-law funded a super PAC that supports you with $125,000. How do you respond to Mr. Ahmed? Well, my, my family's come under attack a lot in the last few weeks uh, with some pretty wild and dishonest accusations. My in-laws made a, in their personal capacity, a contribution to support someone they believe in, running on a platform that they believe in, Medicare for All, Green New Deal, and more. That's very different than contributions from corporate lobbyists. And let's be clear about that. Corporate lobbyists give contributions in their professional capacity in order to buy influence for their corporate clients. In, in Gabe's case, we're talking about Eli Lilly, the insulin profiteer. We're talking about big tobacco. We're talking about oil and gas companies. These are the very, these are the very interests that are rigging our economy to raise costs that are profiting off a broken healthcare system in the way that we just talked about. Those folks are not giving my campaign any money because they know that I'm running for Congress to take on corporate power in Washington. Well, they know that I've been fighting for years to stand up to big pharma. Your, your comment has drawn a lot, a lot of interest. Hold on, we're going to start with Ms. Cano. Mr. Regenberg, um, does your father-in-law work in a corporation? Yes. Yes, but in your AFC report, you didn't actually list that corporation when you took personal uh, you know, donations from him. So why is this not something that you should be accountable for? For the borders of Rhode Island? He said he didn't know. I'm not sure. Uh, just I to be clear, so a campaign finance report today, I saw this as well, uh, listed your father-in-law with a not employed uh, next to the place on an FCC report where you write the employer of someone. Oh, oh, that, that's, a, a, that's an accident. We'll, work, we'll correct that. Okay, Kay, okay, well, okay. can, can I jump in here? Hold on, hey, candidates. We have too many. Mr. Gonsalves, briefly, go. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to say I'm the only candidate on this stage, in fact, that's not, that has agreed and pledged to not take any corporate PAC money, any fossil fuel money, or, okay, or, or so this is this is or uh, we're not taking money from Washington D.C. So we are powered by the people, for the people, and beholden to the people. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars that are pouring into these campaigns from Washington, D.C., and I can assure you that our contributions are coming largely from in-district donors, and that's an important distinction because we need to make sure that the next representative in Congress is working for you, All right. the people. Ms. Kizada? Uh, it's the same thing. He lied about it because he said he didn't know anything that his parents, was do his father-in-law and his mom was doing this for him, and that's not true. That he's saying, and he said he fought for people, he never fought for anything in his life. He hardly had a job in his life. He never done any, any other thing, you know, fight. It's very easy to say that word, but fighting for things is people like me. I fight for everything I had in my life. All right. He never fought for anything. Mr. Regenberg, obviously, I'll let you respond. 30 seconds, please. Well, I, I mean, I find this very offensive, not just for me, but for everyone who works in the nonprofit and public sector. I mean, I'm very proud of the work I've done, the jobs I've had as founding executive director of a citywide nonprofit in Providence that continues to bring young people together to make changes in our schools. I've, I've worked as senior policy advisor for the city of Providence. I've worked in our federal judicial courts. And I've worked as a legislator, bringing people together, building coalitions to pass major progressive policy reform that's impacted hundreds of thousands of Rhode Islanders. Paid sick days so that folks don't have to keep making that choice about do you send your kid to school sick or lose a day's pay. Hi, pay, pay raises for tens of thousands of, of tip workers who hadn't had one in 20 years. Ms. New Kezada, clean energy please. Excuse Ms. Kezada, me. Kezada, can I, can please. Ten, ten more seconds. I, I, I'm very proud of the work that I've done, and I think that the young people who've benefited in our public schools, who have 
free bus passes because of the organization that we founded and the work that we did. It's, it's, it's not easy to be an executive director, finding fundraising okay. not just for yourself but for other employees. I think I, 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 we get it. The, I want to hear from Mr. Berbrick briefly on this because I'm going to pivot to another Look, topic I, I here. I find it somewhat comical and actually really disturbing uh, that you would come up here and, and say, you know, that your own father-in-law uh, manages $230 million of investments in fossil fuel companies. That's those and those fossil fuel companies, so if I'm connecting the dots, the fossil fuel companies are fueling your campaign. Okay, okay, I, I need to respond to this. 15 this, seconds, this, and this then is we a, move on. This is a explicitly dishonest attack. Don't take it my word for it. One of the leading climate experts in Rhode Island, the head of the Climate and Development Lab at Brown University, called this a dishonest and disingenuous red herring. My father-in-law is an employee at a company that has less than one-tenth of one percent of its portfolio in fossil fuels. Okay. To be clear, Capital to be clear, to be clear, that's that's 40 times less million. than this US, than the Rhode okay. Island State okay. Pension Fund. Mr. Gonzalez, we've heard from you. Ms. Ms. Matos, Ms. please Matos. give Matos a chance. I haven't had a chance to address. The issue here is that it's a pattern when Mr. Roggenberg, from the beginning, he said he would not run for this office because he thought this was a seat for a woman that should be running. Then he changed his mind. Then he told Senator Quesada. He called her and says, if you run, I'm not going to run. She's running, and he's, and, he's, and he's here. Then he tells us that he didn't know that a super PAC funded by his father-in-law and his mother uh, was being, uh, they, were, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't know about it. And on top of that, he's telling us that he doesn't believe in super PAC, but then had a secret information in his website for specifically, only lasted 48 hours, specifically for that super PAC. And now he tells us he didn't know that the report didn't have his father's uh, father-in-law employer in there. So, in, but you know how much his employers invest in, in the fields of fossil fuels. So it doesn't add up. Okay, we have litigated this to the extent I want to litigate it to, and I'm going to shift topics here to you, uh, Ms. Cano. Over the weekend, you initially accepted an endorsement from former Democratic candidate Don Carlson with seemingly no qualms, even though he exited the race after we revealed an inappropriate interaction he had with a student as a college professor. Ms. Matos criticized you for accepting the endorsement. Hours later, you issued a second statement expressing concern about Carlson. Is that an acknowledgment that Ms. Matos was right and you should not have embraced the endorsement initially? So let me be clear, I didn't seek an endorsement, so I want to make sure that you all know that when that statement was sent, that when I, my team and I like, sent the response, I was just acknowledging the part of what I read. He was uh, speaking about my candidacy and addressing his voters to send them to me. I understand that. But then I don't take any of the accusations or the implication it's slightly, those are very concerning. And I call it out, and that's why my team and I sent a second statement, because I wanted to be thoughtful about what I wanted to say. And I always look at things with all the grounded facts instead of making judgment before I know a, a conclusion. And I did, in fact, the same thing with the um, controversy with Lieutenant Governor Matos, and that was specifically what I say there. I, I don't think no one here have all of the grounded facts. Yes, it was concerning, and if we talk about abuse of power, that is what I called out. All right, well, Ms. Matos, uh, Ms. Cano um, did, as she said, um, withhold on criticizing you when your campaign was under scrutiny regarding the signature scandal involving your nomination papers. She just cited an ongoing attorney general investigation there that has yet to be completed before speaking out. Why not afford the same courtesy? Was this a political cheap shot on your part? No, I was very disappointed because I, Actually, Senator, um, the Senator has been very kind, reached out to me and told me that she knew that what I was going through was not fair. So, and I'm thankful for that. But what I have to say is I was surprised to see her embrace that, um, that um, endorsement, especially on light of the accusations that has been made. As a mother, I'm concerned with those accusations. So I was very surprised to see her embrace that. 30 seconds, Senator. So 
Thank you. I just want to say that it is very important that when we have sensitive information, we acknowledge it, but we also, as public elected officials, we need to be very careful about how we do things, and we don't use political points to advance in an issue. There is nothing that I have in this campaign as a scandal or a controversy, and it's going to be this kind of calling out on me because I supposedly took an endorsement that I didn't seek. That is really, really disappointing, Lieutenant Governor. Really disappointing. We're going to move to a new topic because there are a lot of you, and we don't only have an hour. So, candidates, just as we discussed earlier with health care, uh, Democrats in Congress almost universally agree uh, climate change is a significant problem that needs to be addressed. But again, they disagree over exactly how to address it, including how to generate enough electricity to meet demand as the country potentially phases out fossil fuels. Now, as part of his efforts to tackle climate change, Senator Whitehouse of Rhode Island, of course, is a lead co-sponsor of the Advance Act, which would take a number of steps to expand the number of nuclear power plants in America. Uh, Mr. Casey, I'll, I'll bring you into the conversation. I'll start with you. Do you support or oppose Senator Whitehouse's bill to expand nuclear energy in the U.S.? Thank you. It's nice to get a chance to speak. Um, <laughs> I do support Senator Whitehouse's legislation. I think nuclear power is a viable option for us right now. I think what we need to do, though, and we need to be careful, is right now we have a failing grid system. So we need to, we need to do extreme upgrades on the grid infrastructure to be able to handle the capacity that we're going to, be, that we're going to take on. Mr. Gonsal, same question. Do you support Senator Whitehouse's Advance Act on nuclear power? So I would have a conversation with the senator. I want to look into it more in depth. But what I would say is I support a federal Green New Deal. I think we need the most aggressive climate justice legislation so that way we can address the existential threat that we're experiencing in our community, which is climate change. But to nuclear power specifically, there is dis uh, debate in the Democratic caucus about whether that should be part of the portfolio used to address climate change. Where are you on nuclear power? So again, I would look very diligently into this issue, and I would consult with the senior senator. Do you have any gut reaction, or do you feel open to nuclear? I, I think ultimately, look, I'm about the most aggressive climate justice legislation at the federal level. So if that's going to get us to that end, then I'm right there. Mr. Almo. I'm very open uh, to, to the expansion of nuclear, but I, I do think we have to be very, very thoughtful as it relates to safety. Uh, as it relates to the general concerns, siting is going to be an issue. I trust Senator Whitehouse. I have had an opportunity to work for him, and I would say that uh, we would need to collaborate uh, as much as possible with all of the parties that are going to be affected by the expansion of nuclear power. Mr. Regenberg, I looked. Uh, Senator Sanders, who was here for you over the weekend, was one of just three Democrats who voted against Senator Whitehouse's bill. Which senator do you side with on this one? So I'm really proud to be the only candidate in this race that's been endorsed by climate and environmental organizations. This is the work of my life. Um, I'm not super familiar with the advanced legislation and the details, so I would want to speak to Senator Whitehouse. I trust him a lot on these issues. My gut reaction, which you asked for, I, think that, I don't think that we should be working to close down existing nuclear because we need all the energy we can that does not come from fossil fuels. But my understanding has been that Building new nuclear power plants is a long process and a profoundly expensive process, and we need to be moving fast on the climate crisis. Um, and my understanding has been that geothermal, wind, solar are faster, more efficient ways to get there. Again, I'd want to look into this and, and talk to the I'll, I'll bring you in a second, Mr. I want to get everyone's thought first, and then I'll, I'll come back to you. I can see your face about it. <laughs> Ms. Cano, on nuclear power. So I trust the experts. Senator Whitehouse has been a leader on the climate change. So I would be looking into supporting that bill. But what I would say is I also very proud to have the endorsement of the experts in actually the Senate and the people that have moved Climate Act here in Rhode Island. Senator Oyer and Senator Kalman both supported my campaign. And initially, Mr. Regenberg said that if one progressive woman would uh, probably support, <laughs> you, you, it would be You did be make that point that's a little far from nuclear power, Thank respectfully, you. Senator. Thank Ms. You. Matos. Um, I... Honestly, I have to say I trust Senator Whitehouse. He has been a leader when, when it comes to the environment and in, in protecting the environment. I don't know enough about that legislation. I'm looking forward to meeting with him and learning more. But in general, I trust his judgment because he has been a leader in the area of climate change and resiliences. Uh, Ms. Cazada, nuclear power. 
agree with most of the thing. I think we need more information. We need to find out what's really who is behind this and how they're going to do it for us to, for me to be able to say, see, I will be against it on favor. Then I think that we need to sit down with uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and find out how the process, how it's going to be done for me to be able to decide what way I go either Mr. way. Thank you. Mr. Berber. Yes, uh, I, I do. And, you know, we need uh, cl uh, cheap, clean energy. Uh, we need to diversify our clean energy portfolio. Uh, I'm the only candidate on the stage who, have, who has spent their entire career uh, from, you know, working, bringing leaders together on climate change issues from the local level to the global level, uh, working with the American Red Cross at the Naval War College, at the State Department, uh, and at the Pentagon. Uh, and look, we need real leadership and to, to bring forth uh, real solutions on climate change, and, and it, it doesn't extend beyond nuclear as well. Uh, I think we need to reduce greenhouse emissions. We need to bring those green energy jobs back here. We need to protect the water, land, and air that we breathe. Mr. Casey, I'll give you some more time on this. You, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, briefly. Um, so I don't know where Gabe had the time to work for Senator Whitehouse because he worked for the former governor and two presidents. But my my issue my issue with Aaron is I complete my issue with Aaron is I completely agree that speed is a factor, but we can't we can't go into things too fast. We have grid infrastructure problems. The faster we build things that are going to produce more energy, we can't handle the problems with the grid right now. That has to be the first issue, and we need a national grid infrastructure upgrade. And uh, nuclear power is clean, and let's do it. Uh, ten seconds. Are oh, you sure I'm you work? I'm going to go over Senator. my resume. No, just ten <laughs> seconds. Ten seconds. I, I got to work for Senator Whitehouse when he was a candidate for Senate in 2006. And so I got to do that and, and have also had the opportunity okay. to collaborate with him in other ways. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to get through some more information uh, for voters in a, you know, kind of rapidly here. So we're going to do another rapid fire section, but instead of hands, uh, I'm looking for one sentence answers here or less. And we'll go through these. And to keep it simple, uh, I'm going to go left to right and then reverse the order just so folks at home can, can follow along and our wonderful photographers. All right. Um, do you, uh, Ms. Cano? Do you support or oppose term limits for members of the U.S. House of Representatives? If so, how long? So I, I support, but I don't know how long it would be. Okay. Ms. Matos? I support. I've been thinking about probably uh, three terms, but um, it has to be done in a way that uh, ensures that one state doesn't, lo doesn't lose all of their seniority all at once. Based on my experience with the Providence City Council term limit, you need to think about how it's going to be implemented. So three terms, about six years, what you're thinking? Six right. years, yeah. Mr. I support term limits, three terms in the House, two terms in the Senate. Okay. Mr. Casey. I would support legislation for term limits. Um, I think we would, I would consider something in the eight, uh, eight to 12 year range. Uh, it takes some time to, to go up there and make some friends and bring people together and actually get something done. So four to six terms, Mr. Amo? Yes, I'm supportive, something like three to five terms in the House. Ms. Kazada? I, was, I do support it, but I would say um, senators have to, will be 12 year. I think state representative will be the Senate. I would say six term. Six term. Mr. Berber. I, I do. I do support it. And, you know, having uh, 12 years in the House, 12 years in the Senate, because I believe each generation has an obligation to pass the baton off to the next so that they have an opportunity to lead. All right. Mr. Regenberg. I support it, but... If I'm going to prioritize who needs term limits the most, I'm going to say it's the Supreme Court. Well, funny enough, I happen to, well, you say you support it. Before I get to that question, how long term limits for U.S. rep? You didn't answer that part. I think uh, 12 years makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, you brought it up, and that's my next question. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse has proposed legislation that would create 18-year terms for Supreme Court justices. If the bill reached the House and you were in Congress, would you support or oppose it? Absolutely support. We also need to, to expand the court. We need to require a supermajority of justices to overturn little d democratically enacted legislation. We need to, we need to have ethics uh, requirements for the Supreme Court, like the district court judge that I clerked for. The courts are off the rails Okay, right rap, now. Ra rapid fire section here. Mr. Burbrick? Mm -hmm. the, the average, the, the average uh, years is 18 years that, that is serving in the Supreme Court. Uh, but I believe we need uh, a code of ethics. Well, hold on. So are you saying no to term limits on the Supreme Court? I, I just want to be clear. I am. Okay. Uh, Ms. Quezada? Yes, I do. I will support that. Uh, for the 18 years? For the 18 years, yes. Mr. Amo? Yes, I would vote for Senator Whitehouse's bill if it made it to the House. Mr. Casey? I would, I would present no, no issues with the... I would, keep, I would make no uh, clarification for term limits. So term, no term limits? No. You'd vote against it's, Mr. Whitehouse's bill? That's, that's the way this has been. Okay. I think we need to do it that way. Mr. Gonsalves? 
I would vote yes, and I would also say we have to address the issue of ethics reform specifically on the Supreme Court because you have extremist Republicans that are trying to undermine our basic human rights. So we need to protect our democracy. Ms. Matos. I will support it, but I believe that the ethics reform is the more present thing that we need to work on. Ms. Khan. I agree. I would support it. Senator Whitehouse has a great deal. Ethics reform needs to happen. Okay, no. Ms. Kana, we're going to stay with you here. The Biden administration has asked Congress for $24 billion to support Ukraine in the war against Russia. Do you support or oppose that additional funding? I do support it, okay. um, especially coming from a country that our democracy was very fragile. I know what it is, at the, the aid of the United States and how it helped democracy get into um, what we need to have. So Ukrainians need the support of the United States. Ms. Matos. I would support definitely the, the aid to Ukraine. Ukrainians are fighting for democracy. They're fighting for us. If Russia wins over Ukraine, they're not going to stop there. Right, the Mr. next is going to be Poland, and eventually we're going to be in fighting, um, directly, direct fight with, with Russia. Mr. Gonsal. I think we need to continue aid, but more broadly, I think we need to look at the massive military spending. You support spending. the $24 billion? I, I, I would support it to keep democracy safe across the world, yes. Okay. Mr. Casey. The United States spends an average of $50 billion a year in foreign aid. We've already spent $74 billion in the Ukraine. The president's asking for another 24. I think we're in it, we're in it to win it. We need to, we need to help right now. But I'd really like to get a, uh, some kind of a system to have an accounting of exactly where this money's going and where it's being spent. All right, Mr. Almo. I would uh, support that funding request. And I think right now, uh, democracy is under attack all over the world. And this is a, the, the front that we need to see to its end. And I am hopeful that Congress will get this done. Ms. Quezada. I would definitely support it. They're fighting for the right. And I think that's what the United States fight for. And I would definitely go for Mr. Burbrick? I would. You know, we have a responsibility as, an, as a leader of the free world uh, to protect democracy and freedom. Uh, and so we need to provide Ukrainian people all that they need to deter and roll back Russian forces uh, to, uh, uh, to restore their territorial integrity. Uh, but we also need to think about integrating uh, Ukraine into NATO and, in, and in, in, into the EU. And it also sends a very important signal to China uh, to deter them from taking Taiwan. All right, Mr. Regenberg, $24 billion for Ukraine. I would. I'm, I've been very grateful for the president's leadership on this issue. This is a brutal imperialist invasion by a right-wing authoritarian who, if he wins in Ukraine, he's not going to stop there. All right, we'll stick with you, Mr. Regenberg. Final question of this rapid-fire section. The length of early voting in Rhode Island has come under scrutiny after Don Carlson dropped out of the race on Sunday. By then, thousands of ballots had already been cast. Right now, early voting is 20 days. Should it be reduced, stay the same, or be expanded? I think we need to be expanding access to the ballot in every way we can. We should not be creating more obstacles for people voting. That's what Republicans do. Um, so increasing is, the number of days for early voting in Rhode Island. Yes, and, and I want to be I want to be clear. I have not heard any Don Carlson voters coming forward and complaining about this. I have only been hearing the classic Republican voices who are trying to use any opportunity to restrict voting rights, like they're doing at the federal level. They're trying to do it at the state level. We need to be supporting voting rights, supporting access to the ballot. Mr. Burbrick, early voting. Yeah, I think we need to make it easier, easier, simpler, uh, and more secure. Uh, and, you know, looking at expanding the, I think the in-person voting is even more important, uh, but also making sure that our overseas ballots get to our, our service members overseas who are fighting each and every day right now, and who I'm very concerned that they're not going to get their, uh, their ballots back here in time to make their voice heard. Ms. Kezak. Definitely, I would spend it. I think it's, a, it's very hard sometimes for working families to be able to go to vote. And we should give them all, every opportunity to them to have the opportunity to go early or uh, to vote. Mr. Amo. I think the current number of days is appropriate. I, I think there's a chance of something happening at any point in the election cycle. And uh, ultimately, creating more opportunities for, for people to be able to vote, more places for people to vote, expanded times, that's good for democracy. Mr. Casey. I think uh, 20 days is currently appropriate. Um, unfortunately, uh, things happen in elections and people have to drop out. Um, I do believe, I, I kind of feel like it's a little bit unfair for, for those people that have voted. Um, so I would consider, I would consider at some point 
you know, taking a vote and changing, changing the amount of days that we could do that. I believe it's done on the state level, so you know, we can look at the state legislature to help us out with that. Mr. Gonzalez. I would certainly expand ballot access, and I would also support at the federal... Does that mean expanding at, early voting? Yes, and I would also support the John Lewis Voting Act, which is a critical piece of legislation that would help voting rights across this country. And if you voted early, I hope that you voted for me. Right. <laughs> Ms. Matos. I would support the extending the days. Uh, we have 20 days. I think it's, it's good, a good start right now. I also would support the For the People Act to ensure that we protect voting rights in this country. And also, I would be open to making election date a uh, holiday or changing the uh, date of voting to a weekend so people don't have the, to worry about going to work before voting or, or not voting because they couldn't make it on time from home. Ms. Cano, final word. Access to voting is the right thing for our democracy. So I would support extension of the voting, early voting uh, period, but I also think that our working families often have obstacles to go. So having an election on the weekend or a paid holiday is also a good idea. All right, candidates, all of you, of course, are seeking to join Rhode Island's congressional delegation, and the delegation has outsized influence over military policy in the U.S., of course, because Senator Jack Reed chairs the Armed Services Committee currently, as long as Democrats are in the majority. So I want to talk about defense spending, and I am going to start with you, Mr. Regenberg, on this. Uh, you tweeted out you support a bill called the People Over Pentagon Act, which my understanding is would reduce military spending by $100 billion, which is, I would say, a little over 10 percent of the current level of funding. Now, the defense industry is a key economic uh, sector in the first district. Many people work for military subcontractors on Aquidneck Island in particular. Would you still support that bill, even if it were to cause job losses in Rhode Island? I think there's an, an incredible amount of waste in the Pentagon budget. I don't think that our submarine fleet maintenance is, is in that waste, but I think there's a huge amount. I mean, we've got, we've got folks struggling with housing, with health care. We've got a climate crisis. And the, it feels like the only program that continues to go up and up in cost is the, pent, is the military budget. So I do think that we need, to, we need to, this is about priorities. Do we care about people living on the street? Do we care about people struggling with health care? Uh, there's waste in there. I don't think that the, the you know, electric boat, the programs that we have here in Rhode Island. The electric boat, that. as far as I know, is almost entirely, if not entirely, in the second district. I'm speaking of the subcontractors around Newport and Aquidneck Island. Are you... Are, just so I understand, are you saying you, you don't expect job losses with that level of cut, or it's, it's a price to pay because you think that money should be shifted? I wouldn't expect job losses. You wouldn't, okay. Mr. Berbick, I want to bring you into this because you've said publicly, yep. uh, you've also expressed concern about the country's current level of defense spending. Uh, would you support cutting the military budget by $100 billion as would happen under that bill? Yeah, we are approaching a $1 trillion defense budget. It's not sustainable. And I've spent my entire adult career working in the defense sector. And Look, we've, uh, we've transitioned from uh, ground wars in the Middle East, and we're reprioritizing re our efforts on great power competition. And as a maritime nation, we've got to focus on the, uh, on the maritime, the air, the cyber and space domains, the, the future battlefields. Uh, and so I would be one of two Democratic veterans right now in Congress who would have voted against the NDAA because it doesn't address the long-term pacing threat of China, the most urgent threat of Russia, uh, and we need to reduce. And I would actually be in favor of reducing the defense budget by 10 percent so that we can invest in the critical things like housing, health care, education, the things that are really going to define whether or not we remain an economic superpower. And just for the voters home, the NDA is the National Defense Authorization Act, the big defense policy bill annually. Uh, Mr. Arm, I'm going to go to you, and I'm going to let everyone in on this, of course. Um, you talk often about the, your work for the Biden administration. Yes. We just heard from two people who say the defense budget is bloated and too big. Uh, well, the president you worked for wants $877 billion for the military for the upcoming budget year. Do you support, and would you if in Congress, that level of defense spending? Yeah, the world is unstable right now. Uh, I believe that we need to root out waste, for, fraud, and abuse wherever we can find it. And we can do that and as long as we you know, put some focus on it. But when we get to the point of 10% of jobs in Rhode Island are in the defense industry, 10% of our state's uh, domestic uh, product, that is important. So those are families that I think about. And I think responsibility number one is protecting Rhode Islanders if you elect me to Congress. And I promise that I will do everything I can to protect those Rhode Island jobs. And if we need to make cuts, I still hear from people who experience the naval base closures uh, in the 70s here, and they still talk about the dramatic impact. So we need to 
do those cuts if necessary, if we find that waste, fraud, and abuse is prevalent, but we have to do it very responsibly, especially because the global theater is so unstable. I want to bring in the left side of the stage. Ms. Montos, where are you on this uh, request? You know, the president wants $877 billion. Uh, Mr. Regenberg and Burbrick have suggested $100 billion of that could be cut. As of right now, I would not cut it because um, it's really hard to look at the military families that I work with as lieutenant governor and tell them that we're going to cut the budget and they're going to be worried about it does that mean it's going to be less security for my loved one that are serving this country or we're going to tell the families of the Gold Star families that we're going to cut the military budget and they're going to be thinking that this is what's going to put life at risk. We're going to be very careful when we talk about cutting the military budget. And right now, we need it because we're fighting for democracy. In Ukraine, Russia continued to be a threat. China continued to be a threat. This is not the time to cut it. Ms. Cano, same question. The $877 billion is what the president wants. Some candidates saying $100 billion off that. Where do you stand? With that $6.27 trillion budget, there's no reason why we shouldn't have a strong military to protect our citizens and also prioritize services for our care economy and for our priorities for working families. What we need to do is make sure we do look at the proud gouging, look at accountability measures, and as a member of the Finance Committee, I have done that here in Rhode Island, and I think that we need to send someone to Congress that is able to look at those things, and we could do both for our Rhode Island um, uh, people, especially committing to the jobs that we need to protect here in our state. I, I don't want to put words around, I just want to make sure I understood. So you would support the 877, you think there's room elsewhere in the budget for other priorities? 100%. Okay, Mr. Gonsalves. I would say, I just want to say thank you to our veterans for all the work that they do and the valiant service that they show every day in Rhode Island. But what I would say is there is a lot of wasteful spending at the Pentagon. And there's also 800 lobbyists at the federal level, more for every single member of Congress. And I think we have to address this issue. We heard about the cost of living. We heard about housing. We heard about education. I want to invest on jobs and education instead of war and annihilation. So, you know, even Senator Reid talks about there being waste in the budget, but he is supporting this $877 billion bill to fund the Pentagon for next year. Would you vote for that bill, or would you be more with the $100 billion cut bill? I would be looking at cuts. I think we need to think about what we, we need to do to keep our families safe, certainly abroad in here. But I think simultaneously we need to invest in education. We spend 10 times more on military than we do education in this country. Mr. Casey, which, which side of the poll are you on on this question? Um, I would support uh, Senator Reid. Well, what I want to do first, I want to congratulate Gabe because he's getting better at the debates because he's <laughs> using all my figures from the last debate. But here's, here's the real rub. I think everybody is getting away from your question. And your question was, do you support cuts in the defense budget if it affects Rhode Island's economy? The answer is no. And it doesn't matter what district it's in, first or second district. There's 34,000 people employed in the defense industry. We have 1,200 businesses in Rhode Island that are secondary and tertiary to the big industries that we have here that support those businesses. We can't do that to the people of Rhode Island. They have enough issues now economically. Ms. Casado, let me lay you into this. I would definitely go for the cut. Mm -hmm. I think we need to invest in our climate change, and that would bring good paid jobs to Rhode Island, too. Then uh, it's a lot of money that we waste in, 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 in the Army, and we need to look into invest in education, invest in our um, a program to prevent more children dying from overdose, then I think those are the money that we need to invest back to people and not just to the army. I have to admit, I'm not used to so many candidates being on stage that I can't tell the corners of my eye who has raised their hands. I think I saw you, Mr. Burbrick. Yeah, just for you know, one of the greatest threats to our country right now, uh, and having spent uh, the last two decades focusing you know, at the highest classification levels, is the threat in the undersea domain. Uh, and so, yes, we, we, it's important that we uh, eliminate fraud, waste, and abuse and, cut, and make cuts, but not at the expense of our submarine force. All right, I'm taking a look at the clock here, and I want to make sure we leave enough time for, believe it or not, closing statements are just a couple of minutes away. But I think I can squeeze out two questions here. <laughs> um, so let's do this again. Raise your hand if you would support legislation that would legalize recreational marijuana at the federal level for people 21 years of age or older. That's a yes from everyone. And a more light one, I suppose. Last year, the Senate passed a bill. It was called the Sunshine Protection Act that would make daylight savings time 
permanent. So more turning back, no more turning back the clock in the fall. It died in the House. But if the bill comes up again, raise your hand if you would vote for making daylight savings time permanent. Why? You're unsure? <laughs> I hate moving the clocks back and forth, but I got to better understand, you know, the pros and cons to it. To be honest with you. All right, Mr. Casey, you didn't raise your hand. Same thing. I don't see why I don't see why this is a valid question. Oh, because it's oh, a bill in yeah. Congress <laughs> <laughs> sponsored by a U.S. senator from ask, Rhode Island, Mr. Ask, Casey. Ask my teenage children why it's, yeah. re okay. why it's well, relevant. <laughs> I like things the way they are. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. And okay, Ms. Casey, go ahead. Oh. One of the things knocking on doors. And briefly, we have to get uh, to closing. One of the things knocking on doors. Somebody brought that question to me. Really. And one of the things that you said that you would like to keep it one way because children with disability have an issue when the time change, and it's very hard for them to get used to it again. Then I would go for in which you just got one time. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Sure. Regenberg. Twenty seconds, please. I agree about keeping it one way. I've re I've had re read some research that it's actually healthier to keep it the other way. And so I want to have that conversation with the senator. I'm, I'm very surprised of all our topics. This one has divided <laughs> wow. uh, the stage this so much. This was our quickie at the end when you got to get to close. That's yeah. right. <laughs> all right. So now uh, each candidate has the opportunity to give a 45-second closing statement. We drew this order randomly uh, prior to this uh, tonight's debate. So up first, Ms. Cano, your 45-second closing remarks. What we continue to see in, in our country politics is exactly what is wrong. Our democracy is fragile. We need to send someone to Congress that is willing to build coalitions and have the experience. I am the only candidate in this race that have the legislative experience at every level of government. I am ready to represent you, and I hope you give me the opportunity, because we need someone in Congress that have the lived experience and understands Rhode Islanders. I hope that you vote for me September 5th. I'm Sandra Cano, and I hope you support me. Gracias. Mr. Regenberg, your 45-second closing statements. You know, for years, we've been lucky to be represented by David Cicilline, a progressive champion who's had the courage to take on Republicans and stand up to the world's biggest corporations. I'm running for Congress to continue that kind of advocacy. Because for years, we've been doing this work in Rhode Island, organizing in our communities, passing paid sick days, raising wages, creating new clean energy programs. That's why our campaign is endorsed by climate and environmental organizations, endorsed by local progressive leaders and national, folks like Congressman Jamie Raskin, who worked with David Cicilline to impeach Donald Trump, folks like Senator Bernie Sanders. For the next week, my opponents are going to be coming after me with whatever they can. And anyone who's pushed hard for change knows that that comes with the territory. I know that together we can win a fair economy and a livable future for our kids. And with your support, I'm excited to get to work. Mr. Regenberg, thank you. Now, Ms. Matos, your 45-second closing statements. Thank you for this opportunity. I want to say to voters that this is a country that has given me so much. I came here as a 20 years old, not speaking the language. And I've been able to be elected to the local government to serve you as a local government, as a city council, now as lieutenant governor, and now the audacity of running for Congress. This is only happening in this country because of the strong democracy that we have. Democracy is worth fighting for, and that's why I'm in this race, because I want to go to Washington to fight for a woman's right to choose. We have to make sure that abortion is protected. As a mother, I'm always worried that my daughter's going to have less rights than I did. We have to fight for gun safety legislation that protect our children. We have to finally pass the law to remove assault weapons from our streets. That's why I'm running for Congress, because the stakes are high. Thank you, Ms. Matos. Mr. Burbrick, your 45-second closing statement. Look, we are at a defining moment in our nation's history. Uh, we have an economy that doesn't work for working families like yours and mine. Our daughters and granddaughters have lost their fundamental right to choose. Our kids and communities are being gunned down. Our planet is in peril, and we are one wrong decision away from fighting another preventable war. Uh, and so I resigned from 15 years of federal service without a paycheck, personal wealth, uh, political connections or dark money coming from DC because I fundamentally believe that I have an obligation to continue serving and fighting for you. And I'm going to do that the only way I know how by listening, by being honest with you, and fighting for you each and every day, whether you voted for me or not. Thank you, Mr. Burbrick. Now, Mr. Gonsalves, your 45 second closing statement. My name is John Gonsalves, and I'm a two term city councilman representing the east side and downtown in the city of Providence. I'm also a fourth grade teacher at the Wheeler School and have been a teacher for nearly the last decade. 
I grew up in a single parent household and despite growing up in poverty, I remember when I was 12 years old, my mom would go around to every single event that Congressman Cicilline was having and say, Mayor, help my son, please get into this school. That took me on the path from Providence Public Schools to Brown University. Washington isn't working for us. We need a fierce leader at the federal level who's going to fight for affordable housing, someone who's going to fight for our climate crisis, someone who's going to fight for reproductive rights, someone who is going to put you first. That's exactly why I'm in this race, and I hope I can earn your support on September 5th. Thank you, Mr. Gonsalves. Ms. Quezada, your 45-second closing statements. Well, this race is being held by worthy family and insider connected not by what Rhode Island need. And I would say to you, if you are a single parent struggling to support your family, vote for me. If you are a, a, a factory worker making a minimum wage, vote for me. If you are somebody who lost someone in a gun, gun um, then vote for me. If you are a welfare mom, vote for me. We are here. We cannot continue to let, Rhode Island, to let Washington to buy the seat. Let's bring Washington to Rhode Island, not Rhode Island to Washington. September 5th, both for me, Anna Quesada. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Quesada. Now, Mr. Casey, your 45-second closing statements. Thank you. As a 17-year EMT and firefighter, I put my life on the line every day to keep people safe. In my 10 years in leadership roles at the State House, I brought together business, industry, and union leaders to find common ground and compromise. That's really what this country needs. If you want an example of leadership, look in the audience. Business leaders, union leaders, all here to support me as a candidate for Congress. I'm going to let you know that when I get there, I'm not going to, I'm not going to forget where it came from and who I work for. Mr. Casey, thank you. Oh. Now, Mr. Um, yeah. Was that 45 seconds? It, you had 15 more. <laughs> all right. Stop the clock. Ready? <laughs> okay. As an Eagle Scout and a Freemason, something only one U.S. president has achieved, people can trust me. That's why I believe I'm the best candidate for Congress. Thank you very much. Please vote September 5th. All right. Mr. Casey, thank you. Now, Mr. Amo, your 45-second closing statements. Thank you. Rhode Islanders deserve a congressperson who can have the experience to be effective from day one, who is connected to their deep Rhode Island roots. I grew up in Pawtucket. Uh, I am the son of hardworking people that I got to mention earlier. My dad, uh, who owns a liquor store in Providence. My mom, who's been a nurse in nursing homes. And because of a community that invested in me, I went from chasing after Ripta in order to get to school every day to briefing the President of the United States in the Oval Office. And I know I have what it takes to bring back the resources to help Rhode Island, to help people across the country take care of the big issues that they face every day at home and to also uh, invest in our communities. And so I humbly ask for your support on September 5th. Thank you, Mr. Amo. Now, real quick, the final question that is going to decide this election. Um, I want to find out if you're a Dells person or a Mr. Lemon person. Uh, raise your hand if you're a Dells person. Mm. Wow. Raise your hand if you're a Mr. Lemon person. <laughs> hey, Mr. Wow. All right. Yeah, I'll get the matter. All right. Awful, I, I, I want to thank, I want to thank each of the candidates for taking the time to take part in this debate. And now to the audience, you may applaud the candidates. That primary day is one week away on September 5th. I recommend you shoot over to WPRI.com. We have a digital debate show. Um, of course, we're going to have complete debate coverage tonight on 12 News at 10 and 11, including in-depth analysis from our political analysts. We want to thank Rhode Island College and our sponsor, AARP. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. Have a great evening.